Hey, it's Eric G. Around the House is sponsored by Baldwin Hardware. For 75 years, Baldwin Hardware has been known for its first class quality and craftsmanship in door and cabinetry hardware. As an alumnus of the Baldwin Hardware Design Council, I can say I have seen the details and quality from design to the finished product. If you're looking for a new style and old world craftsmanship, I can tell you there is only one Baldwin Hardware. Check out what would look great in your home at baldwinhardware.com. It's around the house. Another trick that I see that becomes problematic is not having a payment schedule written into the contract. How much goes down? And here's where this issue comes in. And a lot of times it's that original, you know, putting the order in for cabinetry. So let's say you sign up with a contractor. They now need the money to put down on the cabinet package because 20 years ago, many contractors had lines of credit with lumber yards and other places like that. They'd buy the cabinets. And by the time they got invoiced, they were getting installed and they were fine. That is very rare now where many contractors are having to write a $20,000 check for cabinetry first. So this is where you want to make sure that you've got things really dialed in because two things can happen. When it comes to remodeling and renovating your home, there is a lot to know, but we've got you covered. This is Around the House. Welcome to the Around the House show, the original 35 years and running. This is where we help you get the most out of your home through information and education. Thanks for joining us today. Well, I wanted to talk since we're coming into uh, late summer, as August is, we are starting to get into the time when people start thinking about designing that kitchen so they have it ready for Thanksgiving and the holidays. And right now, it's almost too late to get that done in time. But if you're good and you've got a plan, you might be able to knock that out. So today, we're going to talk about planning for that uh, for that kitchen. Maybe even get into a little bathroom if we can make time. But uh, we're going to start out trying to make sure we cover the kitchen carefully here because this is one of those things that um, can be really really hard for people and there are so many moving pieces and I wanted to talk about those today because there are things you can do out of order that will cost you a lot of money even if you're hiring a pro. So here is where I start. I want to come up with a 30,000 foot plan of what the project is and define that. Before you go talk to a designer, before you go talk to the contractor, before you even plan to do this as a DIY, spend the time and say, okay, I want to do a white painted kitchen, or I want to do a black walnut kitchen, or I want to do a cherry kitchen, or whatever you want. Get that to find out first before you drag other people into it so you know what your plan is. Now, if you can't figure out the colors and you don't know which direction to go, that's okay. That is where you lean on your certified kitchen designer to do that for you. And here's the thing. A designer, unless you have done dozens of kitchens, that certified kitchen designer is going to save you money in the long run almost every time. And here's the thing. When I'm hiring a designer or training a designer, and I've done this for 29 years, so I've done this, I've managed crews, all of this. I've trained designers from never designing into heading off to college to get their degree and have turned into be great designers. Here's the thing. It takes a kitchen designer about two years to really get decent at what they're doing. And that's working 40 hours a week and not making mistakes, and really getting things dialed in. And so when you look at the thousands of hours it takes, you as a homeowner, because maybe you've designed one other kitchen, you are going to be missing out on good design ideas. You're probably going to make mistakes that are going to cost you money. You're going to get things out of order, whether it's a DIY project or a contractor. And that could cost you money. Or a worst case scenario, you're going to order stuff that doesn't fit. And that can cost you tens of thousands of dollars. So we're going to talk about that here today, about what some of these best practices are. 
And so let's back up at your 30,000 foot level of this kitchen project. If you go, hey, I'm going to open up this wall or I'm going to go over and do this or I'm going to do that. This is kind of where you need to stop. And you need to have a solid conversation with a certified kitchen designer. And I say certified kitchen designer because they're the only ones out there that have taken an education curriculum through the National Kitchen and Bath Association that assures you that these people are trained. And you don't get that with many different organizations. And I'm going to make some interior designers mad right now, but that is the only group out there that is teaching residential kitchen design to that level. The ASID is great for commercial projects. In my opinion, they do not train people to be residential kitchen designers. They don't. It, they don't get into that technicality. And uh, it is one of those things that if you are looking for that qualified designer, now there are great designers out there that are not certified, but the ones that are certified, you know you have someone with a test-proven skill set to tackle your project. Now, if you're going to be moving walls and stuff like that, this is where that designer, contractor, and a structural engineer are going to start to define this project. But I want you to have these conversations first with your, with your team or potential team because really you need to design this kitchen out and have a plan of what you're going to do before you go get competitive bids if you're going to hire a contractor to do it. If you bring in three different contractors with three of their own designers and you have nothing to measure off of, you are wasting your time. Now, if you want to interview kitchen designers and see who can come up with the best plan, that's great. But usually, if you call in three contractors that have designers they work with, you're going to have apples, oranges, and bananas you're trying to to compare on equal terms. And you can't do it that way. So this is why I want you to do a lot of your homework on the front end so you can know who's giving you a fair price. And who's trying to lowball you to get in the door and go, oh, I didn't know you wanted real metal handles for the cabinets. I got these dollar Home Depot ones. And that's where you want to make sure that you've got that plan down. And if you're moving walls, I want to make sure that you've got a, a contractor and or structural engineer involved in doing that. So if you know it's a wall and you're going to remove it, a quick conversation of, hey, is this going to be a $200,000 remodel that I only have $100,000 for? So this is where these things really start to pay off is understanding what your budget is before you start the process. Two, seeing if your rough plan might fit in that budget. I know plenty of people that go, hey, I got a $60,000 Remodel budget, I'm going to live, I'm going to take out these walls, I'm going to put in hardwood floors and stone countertops, and you can't afford it. Not going to work. And in our next, next segment here, I want to talk more about this because it's not just replacing cabinets and putting them back in. It's not just doing a, a fluff and buff like that. There are a lot of things that have changed when you do this right. And it's something we've talked about in the past, but it's something I want to make sure we understand is that if you're designing a 19, taking a 1970s kitchen that hasn't been remodeled, you're going to probably have three, four, five new electrical circuits that got to go in there because each appliance needs to be on its own circuit. And then second, can your electrical panel handle that? Do you need to do a service upgrade? That could be three, five, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000, depending on what has to happen. So these are where these things compound, and you need to understand the entire scope of it, especially if you're on a budget that's under $100,000. This is where you got to be really tight to navigate this. Now, if you're going to be doing this as a DIY project, great. You might save as much as 50% doing it all yourself, but I'm still going to say if you have a lot of electrical and plumbing work, unless you're really good at it, 
it might be better to have the plumber do it once, do it right, and it's a quick and easy way of having a professional do it. More about kitchen remodeling and kitchen design just as soon as Around the House returns. What's up? This is Stick and Satchel from Steel Panther, and you are listening to Around the House with Eric G. Yeah. We love Eric G, and you should too. show i'm eric g this is where we help you get the most out of your home through information and education thanks for joining me today i really appreciate you guys we've been talking about kitchen remodeling and kitchen design right here and right now i really want to talk about the pitfalls where things can go wrong and maybe it'll be some tips here that can uh, maybe help you learn how to navigate these because i've seen so many times these things just go absolutely sideways And so first, I want to talk about materials out there that go into these projects so you can fully understand what's happening and so you can make informed choices on them. Now, one of the biggest pieces in this whole thing are cabinetry. Where's the cabinets coming from? And I tell you what, I've got uh, a friend of a friend who I'm going to help navigate through this process of really trying to decide how to fix this bad remodel that he paid a contractor to do and got absolutely taken advantage of. This guy spent 120 grand or so, 140 grand, I think actually, and it all has to get thrown away. So that is a worst case scenario for you as a homeowner. And let's talk about how to navigate that. So with cabinetry, you know, I'm concerned when the contractor is going to build their own cabinets unless they are a fully functional, fully custom shop where they are design build and they build their own cabinets. Maybe. I've also seen like that house that I was talking about earlier where the contractor thought he'd make his own cabinets for the first time. And it looked like a four-year-old's erector set gone sideways. And it's just horribly wrong. I would much rather see, in many cases, that contractor go down to the home center and buy cabinets because they're going to have a warranty versus them trying to build it out of their garage. And that's where you got to be very careful. Here's some reasons why. And this is one of the reasons why I think you should pay attention to what cabinetry they're proposing for your project or what cabinetry you're going to put in if you're going to be doing this as a DIY project. Now, there's lots of different levels of cabinetry out there. If you want to talk about the low end, kind of the entry level, that is going to be the import cabinetry places, which now the prices have gone up due to the tariffs, which is quite fair in my mind. Your IKEAs, where you have to put things together and the RTAs are ready to assemble land. Or any of the other kind of more builder basic companies that build very low entry level cabinets. That's kind of where things start. The next step up is going to be what I call the big box store companies, the home centers. And I'm talking the Craft maids, the American wood marks, um, the Schulers, all of these different companies out there that make cabinets that you see in the home centers that are national brands, brands out there. Now, that is what I call kind of the entry to entry middle of the line. So the highest end cabinets in there is kind of what the mid grade is. So if you go into the craft made and pick out the plywood, construction, all the cool things, the soft clothes, all that stuff, that is now in 
kind of the entry level mid grade stuff. And then to get anything higher out of that, you have to go to a kitchen design firm, a kitchen and bath retailer to get it. And now let me talk about the numbers here and then we'll get into the kind of the higher end stuff as well. When it comes to cabinets, let's say you're looking at a, a $7,000 cabinet package at IKEA. It might cost you 10 or 12 at the home centers. You get up into the upper end stuff, that could be 14 or 16. And now when you move up into the mid grades, now you're getting to companies like that aren't in the home centers, the Crystal, the Dura Supremes, the different companies out there that are out there that are in that solid mid-grade that will build you a custom cabinet that will make that cabinet 22 and 3 16 if you need it, or custom heights and, and custom finishes and that kind of stuff. Now you're into that solid mid to mid-upper range where they can make these things for you and come up with it for you. And then you get into the higher end stuff, which is your specialty retailer. And you'll see these in major market cities. Um, there's a few in Portland, but really Seattle, San Francisco, LA to get into these places. And these are brands like from Italy, Valcachin. This is the Downsview, the William O's, all of these brands that if you open up an architectural digest and you see on the inside, generally these are your $1 million or $3 million and up home kitchen cabinet companies. And those are their own thing where you can spend on the entry level that was seven, you're now spending maybe 40 or 50 for that cabinet package. And so that's kind of the flavor of the cabinets out there. But the prop, what makes these things different is one, finish. So if you look at what's done at IKEA, you know, the, the wood panels aren't all the way wood many times. There's wood around the edge of the cabinet box, but in the middle, it could be cardboard. So it's not a full plywood or particle board. There's a mixture of cardboard and particle board to make it lighter, to make it more cost effective. The stuff coming in from overseas could be filled with chemicals and, uh, and formaldehydes because a lot of it has kind of gotten around that. And then when you get into the mid-grade stuff, you start to get into quality finishes where they've got a conversion varnish baked on finish or into the middle stuff where you got a, a, a two-part urethane finish or some of the UV cured waterborne finishes that are nice. So that's kind of where you start to get into the good finishes where you get into the higher end stuff. Maybe you have a, a, a gloss door that is lacquered that has now got 22 coats of hand rub lacquer or hand stained or specialty woods. And so this is kind of what you need to really pay attention to when a contractor or a designer is talking about the cabinet lines. That durability going forward, you don't want to have to spend five, six, seven thousand dollars to have somebody come repaint a kitchen that was poorly done by the local custom shop. Just because someone tells you that something is made custom doesn't mean that that word custom means higher quality. Custom could be much lower quality than what you just found at the home center that's sitting there. And that's where you got to be careful. Don't be dismayed by the word custom. Custom just means they're making it for you, not that they're making it right. Around the house, we'll be right back. Hey, this is Ron Keel, the Metal Cowboy from Keel, the Ron Keel Band and Steeler. We are rocking around the house with Eric G. Raise your fist, make your stand. Welcome back to the Around the House Show. This segment is brought to you by our friends over at Root Quencher and RootQuencher.com. If you're wasting a ton of water trying to water on that slope and the trees and bushes aren't getting any water because it's running down, 
You should be talking to Root Quencher where they put it underground and right to the roots. So that's going to save you a ton of money and have healthier trees and bushes. And who doesn't want that? Rootquencher.com. We've been talking about kitchen remodeling today. And uh, we talked about design a little bit earlier, but we'll talk about that in more detail in the next segment of some of my design tricks. But in this one, I wanted to talk specifically to you that are going to hire a company to come do that remodel for you. And I want to let you know on some of the unscrupulous contractor tricks that I see out there that I want you to be fully aware of. Now, 90% of the, of the kitchen and bathroom modelers out there are really great, high-quality people. But I want you to not grab the other 10% that are out there doing low-quality work and are maybe new, trying to get better, or don't care about the job that they're working on. So the first thing it starts with is when you're talking to them is to get a very detailed estimate. Now, here in the Portland area where I live, I've worked a lot with uh, REF Construction over the years. They're a local construction company that I design hundreds of kitchens and bathrooms with over the years. And I love the way that he did his estimates. He went through and gave allowances for everything. So, in a kitchen remodel, he would say cabinetry by craft made and would have a plan for that and a budget. He'd have the flooring, he'd have the faucet, the sink, the garbage disposal, the electrical work, the plumbing work, the lighting, even what the costs or anticipated costs of the handles or knobs that would go on the cabinets. All of that was spelled out in the estimate long form. So this estimate in a kitchen model can be anywhere from three to six pages really quickly. And that to me, is about where it can be if you have enough things on a large project. If it's a small kitchen, maybe two pages, maybe three. But nonetheless, I want to see that level of detail out because one of the tricks for the bad contractors out there is that they won't put any details on because they don't want to be held accountable for that later on. And here's where that makes a difference. You can spend, if you've been eyeballing this $25 or $30 a handle knob that's going to be the jewelry on your cabinetry, and they priced out something that was literally $2 a piece, and you didn't catch it, well, it was in the estimate. Everything over that is an overage. So these are things that I want you to make sure that you've got dialed in because this can get really expensive quick. And so that's what I want to make sure that we get you dialed in and get that taken care of because those numbers can be so far off And I've seen it happen so many times. They'll say kitchen cabinetry package, $3,000 or $10,000 or whatever it is. I want to see it laid out. I want to see the brand. I want to see the budget. I want to see what the framing costs are. I want to see every little piece of that job spelled out so you know what those costs are. And then some of the other things that I see that are sideways, that go sideways, is making sure that that contractor has pulled all the necessary building permits. And we'll also guarantee that they're going to get the final inspection on that. And let me tell you a horror story that happened a few years ago. It's probably seven or eight years ago, actually. More than a few, but this was like 2019, I think, is when this was. So it was a little bit ago, maybe. Contractor went in, gave a complete budget on the whole project. Design was done, ready to sign the contract, went down to go get a building permit and make sure there were no issues. As a major remodeling company that is well-known in my area, did the remodel on it. But the contractor failed to get the final inspection on that project. So it was never signed off at the end, and nobody ever got a hold of them to have it signed off. So the problem was, 25 years later, it's ready for the remodel to be done. To remodel that addition that was done under that original remodel, they were going to have to take that addition and get it up to what would have been 2019 standards. The problem was, is in the addition, they would have had to re-insulate, change the electrical. This now, kitchen remodel had doubled in price and was over $200,000 because they had to go through 
and remodel work that was beautifully done, but no one had signed it off and building codes had changed and they would not grandfather it in because it had never been signed off on. So these are things that I want to make sure that you follow up that when this project is done, that those have been signed off on and then you're good to go. So those are things. And yes, you, you generally need a building permit for a kitchen remodel, especially if you're doing structural, especially if you're doing electrical, plumbing, moving things around. That's all going to be fit under there. So do you need it for tile? Usually not. But when you're changing lights, adding lights, changing plumbing, that's where stuff comes in. And you want to make sure you get those permits pulled so you're covered. Another trick that I see that becomes problematic is not having a payment schedule written into the contract. How much goes down? And here's where this issue comes in. And a lot of times it's that original, you know, putting the order in for cabinetry. So let's say you sign up with a contractor. They now need the money to put down on the cabinet package because 20 years ago, many contractors had lines of credit with lumber yards and other places like that. They'd buy the cabinets. And by the time they got invoiced, they were getting installed and they were fine. That is very rare now where many contractors are having to write a $20,000 check for cabinetry first. So this is where you want to make sure that you've got things really dialed in because two things can happen. One, you want to find out if they're prepaying for this cabinetry. And if they're dealing with a local cabinet shop, I want you to be in communication because this is where things can go badly. You don't want to have to, and I want to scare you here, but this is just something that you have to be careful with. And this is liens and lien releases. Because if you're a contractor, this is going to be a worst case scenario, but I've seen it happen. So it doesn't mean that it couldn't happen to you. And this is the education part of this. If you write a check to ABC Construction that I'm making the name up on, so sorry, ABC Construction, if that's your name, and they go over and put on their line of credit the cabinetry order, and they pocket that money, spend it on the last project they're trying to get finished up because they misquoted it, and your contractor now doesn't pay that bill, they're coming after you and could put a lien on your house until that bill gets paid. So from major manufacturers on this stuff, you want to make sure you have a discussion and have lien releases to you, the homeowner, ask for one to make sure that the ability to lien has been released, if that makes sense. So you want to stop another company from not getting paid on your project. Now, if you can pay the cabinet shop directly, that can be okay. The only thing that can be bad with that is that when you buy those things through the contractor, in many states, that warranty is covered for replacing it. So if you go buy a faucet and give it to the plumber, for instance, the plumber might not warranty coming back and having to fix it if it's defective. You might have to pay them twice to do it versus if you bought it through them, they have to have it covered. So things to think about when doing that remodel. We'll wrap it up in the last segment as soon as Around the House returns. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Around the House show. This is where we hope to get the most out of your home through information and education. 
Thanks for joining us today. We've been talking everything about taking on that kitchen project and what are some of the pitfalls and dangers that you should be looking out for. And now we're going to talk a little bit about design as well and what's hot and what's not and something to really consider whether you're on a budget or not. And these are all quality things you should pay, be paying attention to. One more thing that I want to see when you're doing your research on the contractors, and I say this all the time, but it's an important one. When you're talking to that contractor, do your research. Are they licensed, bonded, insured? Do they have a great portfolio of projects? Do they let you talk to some previous project owners? And you could go take a look at the project maybe. Understand who their customers are and uh, don't just trust everybody, anybody because I know people out there with big names that are in, uh, ah, in the Northwest here. That uh, the chance of you getting ripped off, even under that big famous name, could be uh, could be dangerous, and you could have some very unqualified people going out to your job site. And so these are things to be very careful with, as well as some of the home centers here too. Some of the home centers, if you buy it through the home center and have their remodelers come out, that can be problematic as well because there are some communication breakdowns that happen between the contractor who's an independent contractor working as a subcontractor under the home center. And uh, this gets to be a lot of problems there because you have a lot of different interests going on. And um, there's a lot of people getting involved. And I've seen that go sideways more times than not. So be very careful on who's doing the work for you. And many times there are plenty of contractors that are working for the home centers that are brand new and less experienced because they need to have that home center bring them the leads. And uh, that can be problematic for your project as well. So another thing to be careful with. But design-wise, and I wanted to talk about this because this is a common mistake that people made. One of the, probably the biggest common mistakes that people make when designing out their new kitchen is they copy their layout they had before. Oh, I liked it before. It doesn't mean that you can't upgrade it. Maybe you're not moving the window or moving the sink or that kind of stuff, but you think about it, if that kitchen was put in 1980, how much a kitchen has changed since then and what we've put in it. Now we have, you know, steam ovens, we have sous vides, we have the correct ventilation, we have microwaves that aren't on a cart in the kitchen. So there's a lot of different things, including what we store in that kitchen. I mean, Back in the 80s, you went into the J.C. Penney's or Sears or a couple other specialty retailers to buy your kitchen goods, but there wasn't a ton of stuff on there. Now you walk into a Williams Sonoma or one of the other major brand retailers or just jump on Amazon and you can order 200 different things for your kitchen that you didn't know you needed. So our storage needs in 30 years have completely changed. And the farther back we go, the more they've changed. So these days, what's hot are lots of drawers. So drawers, which are much more expensive than doors and adjustable shelves, are very important. It's much more efficient, and it works out better. The style of cabinetry. In the United States, we have what we call an American face frame construction, where we have kind of a one by two that goes around the box. That is much less efficient than a traditional European or frameless cabinet where there is no face frame around the front. That face frame is structural in the one. And when you go to a more European style cabinetry in a cabinet run, you can gain another cabinet of storage space. And then with those drawers, we're seeing lots of accessories and pullouts. But even with a lot of drawers, you do want to have one cabinet, probably at least 21 inches wide that you can put tall things in and uh, stand up in there that won't fit into a drawer. So these are things that are really hot and will continue to be hot because you can get more in there. And another trick to look for in the design process is open up the drawer of the kitchen cabinets that you're looking at and see how much space is behind them. Some cabinet companies put in shorter drawer boxes to save a little bit of money. And that can leave three or four inches of space behind that drawer box. So when in doubt, 
walk over to a drawer bank, take the drawer out and take a peek and see how far those go back. If they're anything over about three inches, I would see if they make fuller length drawers that you can use the most out of that because that is usable square inches of storage that you should have managed. And now some of the other mistakes that I see happening come around with refrigerators, for instance, in the design. The French door, upper French door refrigerator with the pullout freezer below is one of the biggest problems in the world of design. These things cause more headaches, especially if it's up against an end wall. There are times that these refrigerators, some models might need six inches of filler space over there just so you can get the door open wide enough to open the crispers inside. Because the doors don't open up at 90 and then they have a handle that sticks out two inches. So there's, let's say that's two and a half inches, but a lot of these doors have to go another 15 or 20 degrees open to get into them. Then you need six, seven, eight inches of space. And if you have an end wall, or a, a um, double oven or a microwave or something that's flush with it there or another pantry, you need to make sure that you have the proper space for that. So French store refrigerators, although they are nice, can be problematic on the design. As well as corner cabinets with appliances up against them. If you put in a Lazy Susan and you have a dishwasher on one side up against it, or you have a range up on the other side against it, this is where collisions happen between handles. So make sure that you've got that plan worked out so that you have things that open up. Sometimes those Lazy Susan cabinets aren't always the best corner option. I've actually had in design where it actually made the most sense to eliminate that corner cabinet and not even use it and use a corner filler and get more drawer space that can be used. Because many times that blind corner cabinet that you have to go reach in around the corner to get stuff that's getting lost back there ends up being much harder to work with. And sometimes you don't have access because of appliances in the area. So sometimes in tight kitchens, not using the corner is going to be your safer alternative. So that's another key one. And another big mistake that people make is ventilation. You need to have a properly sized hood that ventilates completely to the outside. In no circumstance should you have a vent hood that releases back into the kitchen because that is a health hazard every single time. Now, on top of that, if you really like to cook and if you like cooking such, such ethnic foods as anything from Asia, Italian, or anything where you're cooking meat a lot, inside on a griddle or something like that, having a hood that is three inches for a total of six inches larger. So if you've got a 36-inch cooktop, maybe a 42-inch hood that is over 400 CFM that can really move that air, that is a good choice. And remember, if you're doing a decorative wood hood, That wood hood has to be probably at least six inches wider than the cooktop or oven down below it because you can't have any wood hanging over that cooktop. It has to be the full liner. So make sure your designer understands if you're doing a wood hood that it has to be much wider and you'll lose six inches of cabinet space uh, by doing a wood hood on the sides because that hood has to go beyond the cooktop. So that way, it's a fire safety issue if you have a piece of wood over a cooking service that is under 30 inches and not protected by metal. That's why they do those wood liners. So if you ever have a fire, you have a chance of stopping it before it takes over your house. Man, we could do hours of this topic because I tell you what, kitchen remodeling is such a big thing. We'll tackle it again in a few months. Coming up in another episode, we'll do this with bathroom as well and get you all those pitfalls you got to be careful for. Thanks for tuning in to Around the House today. I appreciate it. We'll see you next Saturday. And don't forget on the podcast, the midweek special. Thanks for listening to Around the House. Have a great rest of your weekend. Go
covered Anyway, I'll be on the me Life is a love song, let's be lovers We're all over the radio Take my Hey, it's Eric G from Around the House. Are you planning a decking or siding project this year? If you are, you've got to check out my friends at Millboard. Millboard is a completely different kind of composite decking and cladding that enhances outdoor spaces with enduring distinction. Hand molded from the finest oak, it realistically mimics the natural grain and color of premium hardwood. If you're looking for something that doesn't look like plastic and instead real wood, check out millboard.com. Make sure and check out that interview we did just a few weeks back. That's millboard.com.